So it's our, our final conversation of the day. It's been an amazing day and an amazing afternoon. Ben, thank you so much for taking some time to visit with us. You are the, uh, the CEO of change.org. So I'm going to start with a basic question, which is, um, oh, and just to remind folks that the timer needs to be reset, since that way you guys don't have to stick around here as I go on and on. The Donald Trump got elected largely on the strength of not only using technology in really innovative ways, but he ran his campaign. I'm actually writing a column on this for the Times right now. His campaign was in many ways the first Silicon Valley campaign. He used lean management. He embraced the startup playbook. Is technology bad for democracy? You know, it's funny because uh, I think 15 years ago, if somebody said, well, in 15 years, we'd be having a conversation about the impact that technology had on democracy, it's all... I mean, incredible, transformative public square with due deliberation and sort of real moderation of discourse. And of course, you see some degradation of things that have happened over the past you know, decade in particular. You'd even think of this in 2008. And if somebody told you after 2008, the Obama campaign, that used you know, social media in a social way that was more collaborative, empowering, and not from an individual using a single tool, Twitter mostly as propagation of information, you'd think you'd see something very different. So the question is, is this an outlier or representative of what we're going to see in the future? And I think that frankly that we have, and I mean we broadly speaking in the tech community, have substantial influence about the answer to that question. Whether it's a case that technology will be able to be used by individuals in the kind of way that Trump used tech, or that we build what I would consider to be a more collaborative, more informed, more participatory type of democratic tools, both within places like Facebook and Twitter, but also uh, others that I think some people in this room and others around Silicon Valley should be building. And, and you've talked about the fact that technology should be designed with democracy or with civic engagement in, in mind, that right now we design technology for audience optimization, we design it for profitability, but that there are design choices that could be made for a, a better civic sphere. Yeah. What would that look like? Like what, if, if someone from Twitter or Facebook is sitting in this room and people who know Twitter and Facebook are sitting in this room, what should they be saying to them about what that design looks like? Yeah, I think the first principle is, you know, there's a, sort of this facade that people like to maintain that technology is neutral, that you just provide everyday people for, with technology and they're responsible for what they do with it, which is the biggest lie in technology. Right? The way you design technology, as anybody who is a designer knows, has a dramatic impact on the ultimate sort of resulting use of that platform. And so, for example, Facebook, I mean, the fake news problem is not a head problem to solve. I mean, effectively, I think Facebook will have almost already solved it in the next few months, which is, you know, if you're able to identify with a third party fake news that is going viral, you mark it, and what they've already shown is, you know, you can see a little flag that it's fake news, you try to share that fake news, it basically prevents you from doing so until you double opt in, confirming that despite it being fake news, you want to spread it further to people. That small design shift is gonna dramatically reduce the viral coefficient, the distribution potential of this fake news, and literally one one thousandth of the distribution will happen as a result of that single design shift. And I can go through a litany of things that Facebook could do to sort of accelerate good information. Even though Zuckerberg just wrote this piece, which I thought was quite good, though long, 5,800 words, uh, about the future of Facebook and addendum to the IPO uh, letter that he wrote. And he, he wrote specifically actually about, he, he didn't address fake news, some people, I think, would have thought because he's trying to avoid it. I think it's just because it's not that hard of a problem to solve. The much harder problem is not fake, it's misleading or sensationalized news. And helpfully, Zuck actually calls this out, and the thing that they would do as a quick example is if you have users click on a link and then rapidly return back to Facebook, it is a heuristic, it's a proxy, basically, of information that shows they probably didn't get delivered the content that was promised based on the headline. The headline probably overpromised and was sensationalized. It's the same thing Google has done for Google search results for a decade, where if you click on a search result, come back rapidly, it's an indication input that you probably didn't get what you wanted, and Google then deranks or deprecates that search result. So small examples of what Facebook can do, and that's the same with Twitter and all these other platforms. And so what's, what's the underlying design principle there? Because if, if, if we were to say to people, we want over the next decade for you to design with civic engagement in mind, mm -hmm. What should technology be doing differently that it's not doing right now as part of every piece of tech? Yeah, so I think there's a, a couple of core principles. So one is trusted information. And I realize that is, um, that is subjective, 
But I think that, you know, one of the things that we've done really well on the internet over the past 10, 15 years is trust. I mean, look at the, one of the first, you know, great, great examples of this was, uh, was eBay, right? Without, like, the idea that anonymous people would just be able to automatically sell to one another without knowing each other at all was crazy. And the ranking system that eBay used was hugely important all the way to today. Imagine Uber with no rating systems. Like, you'd have terrible behavior by really aggressive CEOs in Silicon Valley. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was going to say, um, I was gonna say terrible but, behavior by just one person in particular. Um, no, no, but in sincerity, the drivers would not be nearly as good as they are. They just wouldn't be. It's a design system. So I think that trusted information, making sure that the information that is advantaged within your platform and surfaced has some indications of trustworthiness. So as an example, Google already does this. It's a reason Google blew out of the water every other search engine, which previously had a principle of relevance based on content on the page. So if I wanted to rank for you know, voter registration, what would I do with Lycos and all these other players? I would just write the words voter registration a lot of, like hundreds of times on my website. That's what happened, and you got spam and terrible activity. It wasn't very trustworthy. Google leveraged the interlinking aspect of hyperlinks on the internet as proxies for trust, and whatever was the most hyperlinked by the most trusted links themselves got surfaced to Google. So Google's using a trust-based, human-based, although algorithmic system. And I think the, the same thing can happen on every other major platform. And so I think trust and trusted information are hugely important levers for surfacing good content that's in better service of actual, authentic, real information. What role, if we're, if we're trying to push through this change, if we're trying to push, encourage, civic-mindedness in design, if we're trying to push through companies taking their responsibility to the civic sphere more seriously, what role do not-for-profits play mm. in pushing that versus that, you know, not-for-profits are no different from anyone else. Everyone should, should have some responsibility for this. So I think that if you, the, the analogy that I would use is maybe a strange one um, for some people, which is look at something like the social responsibility of other companies in totally different non-technology domains like Nike. So Nike, you know, ends up having these negative third-party externalities. They're just a private business optimizing on profits. It happens to be the case there's this negative byproduct of health and safety regulations and sweatshops in Asia. And because of advocacy groups, they held them responsible. And the outside advocacy and persistent awareness made them incorporate this into the consideration for their supply chain and change their behavior substantially. So I think that actually you're going to end up having lobbying on the outside of Facebook and other you know, platforms that will hold them responsible for more specific consideration. That's really interesting. Totally. The, the second quickly is, and you had the same thing with supply chains, you then had nonprofits that help Nike do it effectively. So one is outside and inside game. Outside game is pressure them from an advocate's perspective. Inside game is like uh, Center for Science, well, there's, there's a number of nonprofits that Facebook is using as a third party to indicate whether something is fake or real news. And so these are nonprofits that have lots of trust, and nonprofits can play a collaborative role with Facebook and Twitter and Google, but in particular Facebook, to be able to identify this misinformation. You know, Brittany, who on our last panel, sort of spoke up at how powerful she thought hashtag Ferguson could be, right? That is a small activity. Now, there's been a lot of the, the other word for this is slacktivism, right? That, that it's an easy release valve that makes me feel like I don't... And change.org is sort of at the forefront of this, right? That you guys are Wait, the, the forefront of slacktivism. <laughs> you're, you're, you're the poster board yeah. For, yeah, yeah. for absorbing this, this complaint. Do you, do you think any of it's valid? Uh, no. I mean, I totally understand it. it it's, a, it's a totally reasonable gut intuition and reaction to people that are doing seemingly trivial things. The reality is... We, we call them petitions, they're really campaigns, and the vast majority of them, anyone that gets any degree of size, the campaign creator, and this is on change.org or through any nonprofit, will then mobilize the signers to secondary and tertiary actions. They may be calling their member of Congress their mayor, they may be raising money, they're organizing offline events. I mean, it is noteworthy that though there's this sort of this persistent, still, although I think it's decreasing, criticism of slacktivism, you know, some of the biggest protests in the history of humanity just happened, you know, a month ago. And those didn't happen because all of a sudden it became easier to do offline organizing. It's because the most effective way to mobilize the most number of people offline is to use the internet online as a mechanism of initial aggregation and then mass communication. And so actually there is this intimate interplay between the two. The easiest way for us to have persistent and powerful 
offline movements is not just, I mean, one of the funny things about this is you talk to any offline organizer, what is the single most important thing for an offline organizer when you have all these people in person? It's get their email address, <laughs> literally, because they realize that persistent mobilization is a necessary component of effective political power, and you can't do that if you don't have people's contact information. It used to be phone numbers. It is for mobile purposes, but really email is the single most important vehicle for one-to-many one, one communication. So anyway, so I understand it. There's just not a lot of data to support it. And on the contrary, on a daily basis, there are offline campaigns that are facilitated through the internet, through change.org, also all around the country. And, and I'm going to open this to questions in a minute. And, and I want to invite everyone to ask a question or to think, and here's, the, here's what the challenge I'm going to pose to you, is we are at this critical moment where democracy and technology are coming together, being married in this incredible way, and it elected a candidate that most people who work in this industry abhor, right? And it's not enough to sort of say like, well, it's this one deviation that you know, we had Obama. I think there's something deeper there and some type of message. So as you're thinking of your questions or even just your comments about what does this mean? What can we do differently as an industry or as a world to try and wrest back this tool that I think so many people appreciate that's been used for something that you don't like? And let me ask you, if we were having this conversation 10 years from now, President Trump has served out his two terms very successfully. Um, Vice President Nutso the clown job has taken over and he's now, he's now serving his first term. Who knows what kind of um, interesting country we live in? If we're having this conversation 10 years from now and we have 10 years of using technology to mobilize people who previously never came out to the polls before, mm. What does this nation look like? What's, what's the next 10 years like in the marriage of technology and democracy? And the biggest opportunity is state and local, actually, um, is that regardless of what happens at a national level, which is a longer conversation potentially, there's unequivocal opportunity and there's just massive open space that people oftentimes totally ignore and don't have a clear opportunity to participate in. And right now, we see the biggest, the most energy around campaigns are what's happening in people's districts, what's happening in their cities, what's happening in their states. There's just an incredible opportunity for distributed organizing. In a world in which the only entities that can organize and mobilize, or the ones that have the most resources, are large national groups that of necessity focus on national politics. And one where you democratize access to the tools of organizing, that's happened in Ferguson, it happened in many more places, you end up actually enabling mass participation in a way that actually enables people to have their voices heard in a way that is far easier than at the national level. So I think that whatever happens in the federal level, which I won't comment on now, I think undeniably what will happen at a local level is greater levels of participation, engagement, coordination, things are far less partisan. People come together on things all the time that they would never do on a national basis. And then responsiveness. We're gonna see, I think, with the right tools, local elected officials more directly engaging their constituents That's out of their own electoral self-interest. That's very interesting. Let, let's, let's take questions. Who, yes, in the back there, I think we have one. Is that right? Did I get that wrong? I, it's sort of, oh, here's, here's one, yeah, maybe. sorry. Right here. Hi, uh, <clears throat> my name is Herb Stevens. I'm actually with democracy.earth. Awesome. We're actually a 2016 fast forward uh, company. Congrats. Obviously democracy is very important to us and we're using blockchains. Actually we see them as opening up these black boxes that are otherwise corrupt. Mm -hmm. Are you starting to use blockchains at all or looking at that for uh, you know, technology that's gonna have a meaningful impact on democracy? So, so we have not, although I am incredibly excited that some people are. This is a good example of the kind of sort of pioneering technology that for people to do it incredibly well, I think have to focus and optimize on that specifically, which you guys are doing. And a platform like us would sort of frankly defer to to look at the emergent behavior of experts that are optimizing for a very specific use case and then say, is this the kind of thing that we should be partnering with, adopting, collaborating with, and mirroring in some way as well? This is, this is why it is so important to have lots of other people, brilliant people, the small groups with resources, iterating on addressing the biggest problems of our time. Just as a, it's a quick relevant, I think, aside, is you look at, you know, let's say the, the amount of money that we have spent just collectively in Silicon Valley in disrupting and democratizing different industries, so communications and transportation and uh, commerce, 
I mean, it's hundreds of billions of dollars in tens of thousands of companies, really well-resourced, and they have all benefited from each other. So even those that have failed have, by virtue of the specificity of their failure, taught other people that ended up succeeding what to do and what not to do. And so one of the challenges is that's hundreds of billions of dollars. The no a number of dollars that have been spent on new technology for organizations iterating on a better democracy it's like hundreds of millions of dollars, literally one one thousandth. That is a tragedy and a ter relative to the problem that we're facing, we're multi-trillion dollar problems with a bad democracy, hundreds of billions of dollars invested in tools for improving it, a radical disconnect, huge opportunity and need. And so this is why I'm just thankful, frankly, for this organization, community, and the mobilization that's happening, because we need to have many brilliant groups of small groups of people iterating independently and learning from each other, even if many of us fail, to help everyone else get better and better. Another question? Yeah. Hi, I just uh, wanted to build off of what you were saying about, you know, we need to be doing something differently because there's a couple of things I, I was just thinking. And, you know, in terms of how much, you know, pro-Hillary money was spent comparatively. And I remember being around my, like, international government relations colleagues, like, the day after Brexit happened in New York and being like, oh God, thank God that would never happen here. And a friend of mine who works at Brigade and us looking at his app and be like, it's showing all these states are red. Your user base is all off. And in November, Wall Street Journal writing a piece about how a social media app, you know, helped predict one of the things that totally crossed our minds and the power of platforms like yours to really kind of mobilize action and, and those, the exact point about the largest protests we've had in history have been in the past couple of months when people are talking about armchair activism. So I think just more thought and culture around what we could all be doing differently um, to broaden who we talk to and more engaging of that if there's even more um, that you might offer as words of advice from, from your standpoint. Yeah, so a couple thoughts on this. I mean, one of them, and one of the things about sort of spending money, money in politics, right, the, the overwhelming, like, the, the sort of amount of money that's been dedicated to politics was, was mostly earned media. You know, like Donald Trump literally received probably tens of billions of dollars of free press, um, which is hard to compete with. Um, I, I do want to emphasize the opportunity locally, although in service also of national politics, not to be obsessed overly with local, but it's really powerful in that right, the single biggest, the reason there is a challenge in Congress right now that is not sort of providing, I think, a, a proper check potentially on the presidency, even as Republicans, is because the primary system, I mean, it's, a, it's literally a disaster, right? We have, you know, 15, 20% of people vote in primaries. They're the most extreme people. I mean, a lot of people know this. The fact that that's not a problem that we're trying to address, focus, now I think that there's certain groups, there's swing left, there's a number that have emerged that are trying to address this in creative new ways. We, we talk a lot about how instead of trying to fight the hardest battle first, which is like win the presidency, like what is the smallest thing you could win that is meaningful? right, meaningful, and then build from there. And this is the kind of campaigns we see on a regular basis. This is how you, I mean, the LGBT movement you know, won on marriage equality, not because they fought the hardest battle first. It was, okay, what is the, the, the smallest thing possible that's still meaningful and winnable that we can win? And I think that's, we need to think of a much longer game, right, not just in the next, you know, month or year, but in the next five or 10 years, and build infrastructure around some of these very high leverage distributed organizing opportunities that are going to require a lot of different people, a lot of different strategies, many which will fail, but won't always be focused on what's on CNN or MSNBC or Fox that night. Not that you were saying so, but I just mean that is the natural tendency for most people given the omnipresence of that national news narrative. And another question? Just kind of building on what you were saying, um, in America, voter turnout obviously is only about 50%. How do you think technology can improve that so at least it's equal to what other foreign countries are? Yeah, and this is crazy to me how little investment has been done in this. And so, uh, yeah, the, the, the research shows now that, this is research mostly out of Yale, that the most single effective way for you to mobilize people out is if you know whether your neighbors will know whether you vote. 
So it literally was a 20% delta in the most aggressive of these studies when everyone receives in a neighborhood a note that indicates that, hey, we're going to send a similar note a week after the election letting you know which your neighbors voted or not because we think this is a civic responsibility. It radically increases. Clearly, social contacts, sociability, a sense of identity is hugely important and valuable potential. You can easily imagine a peer-to-peer -peer mechanism by which to do so via mobile. I think that Facebook has the biggest single opportunity in this, even though maybe some other player needs to demonstrate the opportunity first for them, they then scale it. And I think that that's one of the biggest opportunities, GOTV, get out the vote, is how are we not investing more money in it? Just as, as a, a quick thought experiment, right? So the, if you wish that Donald Trump didn't win the presidency, let's say there's about 70,000, 100,000 votes delta there, 100,000 votes, you're just say, well, what is the economic cost of a Trump presidency? You might say, well, let's say it's, you know, it's around a trillion dollars, it's a hundred billion dollars. $100 billion, you would have been willing to spend a million dollars of vote. 100,000 votes, million dollars of vote, right? It's crazy the underinvestment that we're making, not in politics writ large, because lots of us spend on ads, but an investment in infrastructure for leveraging far better opportunities for GeoTV, and the fact that we're not leveraging the new social sort of insights about peer-to-peer -peer influence around getting people to vote is crazy to me and one of the biggest opportunities that I hope lots of people are taking advantage of. Let me ask one last question, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. On local politics, so if you look at the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. after there's an initial wave of protests, usually out of the African-American community, you see that this is carried forward locally, typically by businesses, mm -hmm. right? Bus the, the Business Association of Downtown Selma or, or of Memphis says we, we, we need to integrate our lunch counters. If you look at politics in the 1970s, you saw that local politics was typically driven by business communities. Nixon said that he had genuinely lost when he lost the diner owners of America because people eating their dinner or their lunches would get talked to by the owner. What's interesting about technology is that technology doesn't see itself as a local industry, right? We, technology sees itself as a global industry. That, that's the, the magic of it. And technology uniquely, and I'm going to make an argument that you might disagree with, has been very nonpartisan, very unactivist, has not pushed agendas. Is there an opportunity for this industry, not just in the tools they're building, but for this industry to start seeing itself as a local industry that has local commitments and to start taking sides in ways, whether they're on the left or right, that will push people's opinions and their stances and push them to make a choice? So I think that yes, although I think the single biggest opportunity for the good that these technology companies can do is the leverage through their platform, not their voice. Right? The, the, the way they act, not just what they say, will matter so much more. If you could choose between having Zuckerberg full-throated support of human rights in every single capacity or have him say nothing but change the algorithm of the newsfeed such that you disproportionately surface a diversity of news sources and deprecate things that are random brand new websites from kids in Macedonia, you would far rather have him do the, the latter. It's not that he couldn't do both, and you don't want to hold people responsible for also their social responsibility and what they say, what they advocate for, but the most important thing, the, some of the most important and influential people in the world right now are people that work at Facebook and at Twitter. Because the single most important thing for Zuck is not just the public press, it's literally people that he needs to recruit. I mean, I think that there are, I mean, tremendous good people, these organizations, many of whom are friends of ours, who have incredible leverage over this. And, you know, I would hope that they would mostly use that not for rhetorical flourish and getting people to make public statements about the importance of standing up against the travel ban, though that might also be important, but actually something far more powerful and pervasive, systemic, that touches literally a billion people a day, which is civic responsibility in the newsfeed. It needs to happen, and the best way for us to pressure that, I think, is for hold, us to hold people at Facebook accountable for it. Well, thank you so much. Let's hope that uh, democracy and technology survive. Thank, thank you, you for joining us, Ben. Thanks really so much. appreciate it.